We don't do good things. We all sin. And then, yeah, it's, it's sin. Um, that's our default setting is sin. Um, but with God, He begins to work in our lives His will and His good pleasure, which in, in our response to that is a joyful life in Him. So the good things that happen in our life are because of God's gifts and God's grace. Yeah, that's good. Um, go ahead. It says, it says in the presence and in the presence, He works through you. Like some people think that when He's not there, He's not doing anything. Yeah. So when you just go through that thing, that excites you and like, you know, actually help somebody, mm -hmm. you think it's just because of you, because you did it wrong, but you really did. It's God that's going to be Yeah. Yeah. Well, in that passage, the one who says, in my presence or in my absence, is actually Paul. He's writing from a jail cell. He's writing to this church. And he's saying, when I'm with you or whether I'm not with you, Christ is going to be with you. So kind of what you're saying, you know, he's always there. He's always there. Whether we recognize it or not, he's still working his will in our lives as believers. Now, does that mean that we can just live our lives however we want because God's going to do what he wants? No. We have free will. Okay. Okay. What does that mean? We can do anything we want. We can do anything that we want. But other countries don't believe that. You don't think? Think of other countries that have monarchies in other places. Yeah. Freedom is limited. Israel had a monarchy in the Bible. But sometimes I think Rome was pretty dictatorship because you, you know, so? you know, Julius Caesar was a dictator. Okay. All right. Let's read Proverbs 27. Proverbs 27. Yeah. Isaiah 27, 19. 27, 19. Okay. Yeah. So I thought he said. Yeah. Proverbs 27, 19. As water reflects the face, so one's life reflects the heart. All right, so here, here he's beginning to move, shift this, in the lesson at least, not, not necessarily in scripture, but, but in the lesson he's beginning to shift this idea to now our actions are going to tell us what we really love. As, as you look into water, back in this day, we would say as we look into a mirror in our day, um, mirrors weren't easy to come by way back then, but you would look into water, a nice pool of water and you would see your reflection the same way that it reflects back to you what you look like. He would say, that's what the heart does. The heart reflects back what your real values are. What are the things that you love? But things that things you enjoy that you doing. Desire. That's right. Your desires uh, are reflected in your actions. They're reflected in the ones that you want. Just like I'm an artist and I like drawing. It tells you what you really love. It's like how it tells you how, like, what do you do? What's your favorite thing? You just tell me how it thinks that reflects you. Well, like, how you can, like, greet people in your eyes and love them all who they are. That reflects the Christian. Yeah, love for others. Yeah. And it, when, once it says that it reflects off the heart, whatever your values, the way that you treat people, like as they say, how you love people, like how you do that, is what reflects off the heart. Yeah. That's why Jesus says one of the greatest commandments of God and love others. Why? Because love saturates every area of Christian life. To love others above ourselves and to love God above everything. And it tells us, and if we do that, it tells us where our passions are, where our desires are. Now, are we going to do it perfectly? No. Probably not. Does it matter? Do we still strive for it? Absolutely. That's, that's the goal. And when we don't do what we should do, and as far as loving others and loving God, we repent. We turn back to God and say, God, we're sorry. We're going to do better today. We try each and every day to get better. Sometimes we Sometimes succeed. I'm kind of afraid Sometimes to say sorry. Fail. Yeah. All right, let's read uh, Romans 12, 1 and, 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, the brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal, renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is the big shift in the book of Romans. The first 11 chapters of Romans are very theological. I mean, he's gone through sin and salvation and sanctification and all these really tough principles, sovereignty of God. 
12. And he gets to chapter 12 right here and he says, okay, because What is sovereignty in because God? Because it means that God is in complete control. And in verses one, or chapters 1 through 11, he's talked about God. He says, now, because of this, if you believe this about God, the most reasonable thing that you can do is to offer yourself. So kind of piggybacking off of the verse that you read, uh, the thing that you desire tells what you love. And then Paul here in Romans says, if we, if we love God and we say we love God, the most reasonable thing for Christians to do is to serve Him, to submit our lives, to be followers of Him. Then, yeah, absolutely. It's not. If, if you're not living it out, if I, if I go home every, every night and I tell my wife, hey, I love you, but I never show her, never do anything for her. When her anniversary comes up, I'm like, get away from me. That's not really That's right. That's not really the same thing. It's the same thing with God. Listen, we can come to church every Sunday. And we can say, oh, I love God. We can sing all the worship songs. But if we don't live it, then is it really love? No. That's what, a, that's what a disciple is. A disciple is someone who doesn't just say it. They act it. They follow it. They're a follower of God. We have a, a passage in the Bible, the, the rich young ruler. All right? This, uh, there's a passage where this, this rich young ruler comes up to God and says, what must I do to be saved? And he says, well, obey all the commandments. And he says, done it. I mean, this is obviously a really spiritual guy. And Christ said, okay, sell all that you have. Follow me. And he couldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. Why? Because it's all talk. It's like, you said, you say you love your wife. Mm -hmm. I like it as I can. Yeah. He's saying he does not he's not That's right. Yeah, and he says, yeah, I, I am fully and completely committed. Well, except for this area. So you have to ask the question, what is he really made as God? He had made money in his God. He had made his possessions as well. That was his God. And that's what he was going to follow. And it can be the same thing with us, with anything else in our lives. We can make something else in God. We can I mean, say that. all that we want. We can say all that we want that we love God the most. But if our actions don't reflect it, then is it true? And here's the really scary part to that. If it's not true, if you don't love God, then are we really believers? That's a big question we have to ask. That's what being a disciple means. Now, understand that we're never going to do this perfectly, not in this life. But the desire is there. The desire is there to be a follower of Christ. This is, this is what he said. This is how Jesus did evangelism. You know, he didn't walk up to people and say, hey, I want you to say the sinner's prayer. That's just not in the Bible anywhere. What did Jesus say? Pick up your cross and follow me. Right. How many people did? Not very many. <laughs> well, they because they, they didn't want to. They didn't want to. Yeah, there was. There's, there's another story about these all these other people that come to Jesus and say, say I want to follow you, and Jesus said, Let's go. And he's, well, let me go marry my father first. <laughs> Jesus says, Let's go get married. You know, it seems like a pretty harsh statement if you study the culture. Basically, what he's saying, he's like, I'm going to follow you, but it's going to be on my terms. Yeah, I'll follow you, Jesus, but I'm only going to do it if it's convenient for me. And another guy comes, and he says, uh, he says, I want to follow you. He says, well, let's go. And he says, but first, I need to go say goodbye to my family. I never hear from that guy. Why? Because he says, I'll follow you, Jesus, but I'll only follow you on my own terms. We don't follow God on, on our terms because we can make up some rules and obey those rules. I can make up a rule. I can say, you know, the most important thing about the Christian life is I be at church on Sunday. And I can be faithful to that. And I can make myself feel good about following God and going to church every Sunday. But that's not what being a disciple is. Being a disciple is following God's will. And what is part of God's will? It's joining together with other believers, absolutely. But I can do that, have my little checklist, and not really be a disciple. 
we can, we can kind of build our own framework to make ourselves feel spiritual and follow God on our terms, as long as it's not uncomfortable. I mean, same thing with Peter, where he looks at Jesus and Jesus says, you can't go with me right now. Where I go, you can't go, but you can come there soon. And Just not now. And Peter, what did Peter say? And Peter should have said, okay. Peter said, I will follow you wherever. I'll follow you to the cross. And Jesus said, you can't follow me on your own terms. As a matter of fact, even by your terms, you're going to fail. And deny me three times before the rooster crows in the morning. And so even though he had built a framework where he was comfortable following Jesus, it wasn't, it wasn't the voice of God he was listening to. It was his own voice. We have to be careful. We want to listen and say, well, what does God have for me today, now, in this moment? Not 20 years from now. Here's the, here's the thing. You can't serve God now, 20 years from now. You can't do it. Well, you have to do it now. You have to do it now. This is the moment that you have. What is God calling you to do right now? And it may be a simple task. But a disciple says, even in this simple task, I'm going to follow God faithfully. God may be calling you to be a faithful student right now. He may be calling you to be a loving brother or sister of your sister. He's probably not calling any of you to be a sister. He may be calling you to be a loving brother, son, friend. You stay faithful to even the simple things. God may call you to do extravagant things. And even in those, you have to be faithful. But a disciple is someone that follows God's will. All right, last one, John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Yeah, this is just the definition of Christian. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. So here's what he's saying. If you're not following me, you're not my sheep. That's big time, right? Really tough. The scary verse. When we think about how unfaithful we can be sometimes, we have to ask that question. Am I, am I really a follower of God? Am I really a disciple? Am I really saved? Am I one of His flock? One of His sheep? It's a big question. Big question. So, let's ask some of the questions. It says, he talks about his backstory in there. He talks about being a drunk or being a football player. Those are just two big things. And everybody in this room has a backstory. Um, everybody has a family that they come from, uh, whether they were either in church their whole lives or just kind of getting to know it now, uh, or whatever. Some of you came to Jesus maybe at a very young age, six, seven, eight years old. Some of you maybe just in the last few years. I've been going to church ever since I was very, very, very yeah. younger than anyone else. Yeah. Trust me. But everybody has a backstory. And, and here's the truth about all of them. At one point in our lives, we were all enemies of God. Period. We had set ourselves against Him. We didn't want it. Even if it was young. It was a time in our life where we, we realized that we did not know and love God. We opened up the scripture. We saw that we were sinners. We realized we had denied Him with our lives. And in that moment, we may have turned. For some of us, it was years later when we finally surrendered to God's will, to God's call for our lives. Um, so I, I would encourage you guys to do this. I mean, everyone has a testimony of, of how they were saved, of what God's done in their lives. Have you guys ever sat down and, and written that down? You ever done that? I'm too tired in the morning when I even write it. You don't have to write it in the morning. You can do it at night. But just stop and think about what God has done when you became a believer. What what brought about that? You know, who was it that, that shared the gospel with you faithfully over time? Was it in a service? Was it in a, your parents' bedroom? Was it, um, you know, was it a friend that led you to Christ? You know, what were the emotions and the feelings that went on inside of you as you as you read from the Word, or as you heard a sermon, or as you were at that camp, or whatever it was, uh, I would encourage you guys to write that down. And every once in a while, go back to it. And, and just remember, think about it. 
what God did to, to make you one of his sheep. Because here's what that does. That's going to encourage you to follow him. When you think about what you were and what you are now and what God did for you, the reasonable response, like Paul says in Romans, uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2, those two verses, the reasonable response is to say, my life's yours. You've done so much for me, my life's yours. All right? Uh, Brad mentions that he tried through his own power to do what he thought God wanted him to do. Uh, but he struggled to actually change. So he becomes a Christian and he says, all right, I'm going to do everything that God wants. And he sets out and he goes, full bore. And he fell on his face. He just couldn't do it in his own strength, his own power. Have you guys ever felt that way? Have you ever, got, ever felt like, I'm trying to follow God with everything inside of me and I am just getting it over I should be so much more faithful. I should love God so much more. I should enjoy studying my Bible. How I many of you have ever started reading your Bible and been like, this is miserable? I think a lot of us have. A lot of us, especially if you're in like the book of Numbers or Leviticus. Leviticus is the Bible is pretty huge. It's, yeah, it's a big book. It's overwhelming at times. And we find ourselves getting distracted. And I thought to myself, do you even love God? How can you be reading this word and be distracted by all these other things? And that's, and that's a question that I ask. And I, and I find myself unfaithful at times. And it's always in those times where I think, I'm trying to do this in my own strength, in my own power. And I'm not depending upon God for Him to lead. I'm trying to lead. I'm trying to lead my Christian walk instead of letting God lead me. So in that way, I'm not being a disciple, am I? I'm being the leader. I'm saying, God, you come follow me. Which is dumb. Have you guys ever seen the bumper sticker that says, God is my co pilot? I've seen never that? seen that. If you ever see that, follow those people wherever they're going and tell them, if God is in your car, you should let him drive. <laughs> makes no I sense. But we do that sometimes, right? We do that sometimes. We, we take the wheel and we ought to be letting God take us where he wants to take us. All right? Um, so, so let me ask this question. What is your role in your spiritual growth? To learn more and to share it with others. Okay, to learn more, to share it with others, and then to... Put to action. Yeah, to do it. It's, James makes that really easy for us. He says, don't just be hearers of the word, be doers. So you, you can know a lot of theology, but a disciple hears about God and says... All right, that's what makes him happy. That's what I'm going to do. Why? Well, because he's made me happy. So I want to please him. It's just a reasonable thing. We want to do what God wants us to do because guess what? He's God, and he's pretty amazing. And so if, we were not, if we were not happy about stuff, then how we um, even respond to that? We would need to get our heart right. We need to get our heart right. About I'm mostly depressed. I'm mostly depressed. Don't be sad. Don't be sad. All right? Um, he can we, we study more about what God is and how good we really have it. That would be, that would be my suggestion. Um, next question, what is God's role in your spiritual growth? So if your role is to, to hear and to do, what does God do? He speaks to us. That's right. How does he do that? His word. That's right. That's what you're talking about. That's how we hear God. He's putting it in. He's putting it into you too. Anything you do for him. Okay. Prayer, reading the Bible. Yes. Even through prayer. through what? Through what is the avenue that we interact with God? Yes. Okay, let me what person of the Trinity do we interact with? That's it. That's it. So what how is it that we interact with God? We let his spirit lead us. Now his spirit's not gonna lead us in some sort of mystical, weird way. It doesn't happen. That would be the Bible honest. says that we, we have everything that we need in the Word. The, the Word tells us what to do. So as we open up God's Word, as we hear wise counsel from friends, the Holy Spirit burdens us to do what's right, to follow God's will for our lives. Now, listen, I want you guys to understand, there's some freedom in that. There, there really is some freedom in God's will for your life. Okay? If you want to be a coach, 
You're free to you do can, it. You're free to do it. You, you can be a coach to the glory of God. Now, God's going to define in the Scripture what kind of coach you should be. If you want to be a welder, you're free to be a welder. God's going to define what kind of welder you're going to be. If you want to be a preacher, you're free to be a preacher. But God's going to define what your ministry is going to look like. There's a lot of freedom there in our lives to, to choose our paths, to, to look at what we're good at, what we desire, because those desires were put there by God. It's like, if you do something and then stuff goes wrong, is that God trying to tell you, this isn't what I want for you? Or it can be. I mean, it can be. If it, I think if things are going wrong, it may be because... You may not be good at what you're trying to do. Yeah. I mean, that's sometimes that, that's just part of it. You know, you want to do this this thing so bad. You know, I, listen, I could have, I wanted to be a professional basketball player, okay? But I'm five eleven and I can't jump. Okay, I can desire that with everything inside of me, and that's going to be frustrating, isn't it? Why? Because I don't have those gifts. And I can set my affections on that, but what's going to happen? I'm going to fail. Why? Because that's not what God's called me to do. Because if He had called me to do that, He would have made me six foot seven with some ups, right? And, and some skills. Oh, I got it before. Don't you worry about that. But, anyway, I mean, that, that's, that's an oversimplification, I think. Um, but God gives us the desires. He places those inside of us through His Holy Spirit, through the study of the Word. And, and He says, go do um, certain things, but do them right. Um, and then, uh, next question, fifth question. In what areas does God want to change you? And this question gets pretty personal. Okay, yeah, I think generally He wants to change our heart. But what areas does your heart need to be changed? And we can go around this circle. Make that a very personal question. I don't ever and so, answer any personal questions, so don't okay. let me answer because I do not hey, want to. Hey, I never ask you a question. If I ask you a question and you don't want to answer, you don't have to. But I didn't ask any other questions. All right? So, uh, we can go around. And that's a good question to ask. It's a good question that as you write your testimony and you think about uh, how you want to grow in Christ, it's a good question to ask. Okay, what areas do I need to grow? What areas do I need to get? better in, in my work with Jesus? What areas do I need to work on? Is it my faithfulness to uh, to His Word? Is it my faithfulness to the church? Is it my uh, is it my love for other people? That's one I have to work on pretty regularly is there are some people that are just harder for me to love. Now, Angela doesn't have a problem in the world with that. She just loves everybody. I struggle with that, but I know that I have to work on that. It's something I've, I've come a long way in that area in my life. And some of you are like, there's nothing more to do. But, um, you know, we, we look at those areas in our lives, and everybody has weaknesses around us. Right? And so a good way to attack that is to say, okay, who's strong in the areas that I'm weak? And then go spend time with them. Go spend time getting to know how they, um, how they love others when they're sick. I had a pastor friend of mine who, me and him complimented each other very well uh, because a lot of my strengths were his weaknesses and his weak and his uh, strengths were my weaknesses. And uh, I learned a lot from him about hospital visits and how to and how to just comfort families when they're going through hard times. It was something I just wasn't naturally good at. I'd walk in and say, "Hey, what's wrong with you? You don't do that." And he would walk in and ask him questions, you know, about, oh, their friend or their cousin or somebody that they knew. And just get them smiling and, and just say, oh, I just want to pray for you. And he'd pray for you. And then, you know, tell a little joke on the way out. And, and when he left, man, the family was encouraged. The, the sick person was encouraged. And I was like, I'm going to do that. I want to be like that. You know? And, and so it was just an amazing gift that he had. And I got to learn from him in that way. I think the Spirit does that too. He puts us in a community, our church, with people around us to teach us how to serve and love and obey. Then the last question. Go ahead. So, like, can the struggle be like, like, I struggle to 
like you're struggling, like you know, you don't want to go to church. Sure. But like you have, I don't want to go to church. Like trying to fight that way. Could that be a struggle of like the feeling of not wanting to go? Yeah. I mean, your your desires are are part of your sin nature, right? And you're still gonna. We still have this sin inside of us, and some of our struggles in growing close to God could be very specific sins in our lives. And you guys would know those sins in your life. You may be able to name them, and you may be able to say, I need to overcome this or that before I can really serve God the way that I know I should. Um, so, yeah, I, mean, I think that same, same thing, that the desire for a church kind of things like that is also part of it. Um, the last question, why is it so important for change to happen from the inside out instead of the outside? Because the outside, you're just showing it. You're not really meaning it. That's right. So if you work on the inside, when you start showing it, you know that it's going to be right. That's right. If it's from the inside out, then it's God doing it. If it's from the outside, then it's probably just us. You're acting. Because, I mean, I can fool you guys, right? I can do that. I can make you guys think that I'm a pretty spiritual dude. And you guys can do that to your friends. I mean, you can show up at school, you can have your Bible in your hand, carry it everywhere. Every time someone asks you a question, you can open it up and be like, well, second book of hesitations says. And you can read Anyway, um, you, you can read scripture, you can pray before your meals, you can do all of those things as an outward expression, but not really love God. Like, you, can, you can say the verse off the memory, and you know that you need worship. Maybe. I can only did read you know, the Ten Commandments because I was the baby Bible rule. Rule. The most scripture in all of the world right now is an atheist. He has about 85% of the Bible memorized. And he's an atheist. So even in memorizing the Bible, it can be just an outward expression. It can be. You know, sometimes people, you know, like, people can think of, all right, let's see if can memorize the longest verse. Mm -hmm. the most verse. Mm -hmm. It can turn away from knowing and loving God and then turn it into a competition. Absolutely. And to win and basically Absolutely. boasting. Never try to turn it into a competition. Well, and like, okay, some of you guys came for Awana, right? Some of you guys do Awana when you were growing up. I refuse you guys to know this. You guys it. know this. Awana is task oriented, right? Yeah. Well, the whole program is moving away from that to now be more relationship oriented, which I think is a great move. Because it's one thing to memorize, usually for about 30 seconds, your verses, right? Just long enough to say them and get your check mark. So that at the end of the year, you can stand up there and you can, you know, everybody. So spiritual. The Timothy Award. Do we have any Timothy Award winners here? Uh, yeah, we got some Timothy no Awards. Uh, and so I can. I yeah, I mean, there's a, each year you get your different awards and this kind of stuff. And, and, and if a person was, was doing the Bible memorization and the book work just to get an award, then what has become their God? The award. The award is what they're working for. And so what are we telling the kids? How are we saying that God is not enough of an award? Is he not enough of a reward when we get into it? I love that they're changing the model away from a competition, uh, carrot-based. You know what I mean by carrot-based, where you put something out there and you chase it. I like that they're moving away from that into more of a, hey, we come to church because God's pretty awesome. Why else would we come? Time to look over it and then say it. So, you, yeah. And then, if you didn't know it, you know the next word is this. Yeah. I would do